Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube to stay up to date with what's happening here at Maranatha. There are plenty of opportunities for connection all throughout the year, and we want you to be aware of them so you can come and join in. If you have any elementary age children, we would love to have them in Venture Kids. It's exciting, it's secure, and we make learning about Jesus fun. Just register them in the Family Life Building before service starts. Have you tried coming on Wednesday nights? There's something for everyone in the family. It's a great way to grow as a disciple, to train your family, and to get a midweek refuel to get you to the weekend. Our youth group, Synergy, begins at 6.30. Everything else is at 7 o'clock. We hope to see you this week. It's almost service time. Please silence your cell phone. It only takes a moment and it could prevent distractions for your neighbors. It's a great day to be in God's house. Let's stand on our feet, clap our hands, and worship the Lord. Good morning, Maranatha Family Church. Good to see you today. Let's stand up. Let's clap our hands and get to sing praise to the Lord. Come on now.
morning. Lord, we praise you. The redeemed lift our voices in praise to the one who saved us. Lord, we want to give you the time and the honor that you deserve today. I could not have saved myself. None of us could. But in you, in your great mercy, we have salvation today. Praise you for it. Christ is my reward and all of my devotion. Now there's nothing in this world that could ever satisfy. Set free. 
because once you've tasted the riches, once you've tasted the riches that we have in Christ Jesus, ah, oh, what would you turn back for? Everything the world holds is bitter after tasting the sweetness of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that whenever we have you, we have all. That you are sufficient for our need. the Lord. 
bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Lord, a hand clap praise of praise. The Lamb of God. Hallelujah. I read in a great book where the writer said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. We welcome you to Maranatha Family Church this morning. We've already had one tremendous service and believe this one will be equally so, if not even greater. We've had a good morning. I'm looking out here, Pastor. We if we had our 8.30 crowd, we'd be seating some of them out in the lobby because we've had a good crowd today. We've got right at a dozen visitors in this service. Will you make them welcome? Let them know you're glad they're here. We're delighted to see you this morning. Let's pray together. Father, thanks so much for what you are doing in this place at this point in time and what you're doing in our hearts and lives. We ask, Lord, that you'll continue to move in everything that is said and done, that nothing will take place that would not bring glory and honor to your name. Thank you for these friends that have joined us this morning, and we ask that they will be ministered to powerfully as a result of being here. And we thank you for what you've done, for what you're going to do, and for every victory we're going to have this very week. Thank you for that in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. Before you meet and greet, those of you home folks, look around for folks you don't recognize. Get to them, make them welcome, and tell them who you are. Greet one another. bless you. You may be seated. You may be seated as we move on with our service this morning. I want to mention a couple of announcements to you. If you are a guest there in the seat area in front of you, there's a, a rack that has a guest registration card or guest connection card, whatever. And we would love it if you would fill that out or scan the QR code and drop it in the offering or leave it at the information desk. We say it often, but we mean it. We're not doing that because we're going to aggravate you because we wouldn't do that. But it helps us to put a face and a name together. And we make it a point to try to learn the names of those who become a part of this fellowship. So if you will fill that out, we would certainly appreciate it. Also, the information cards are in the lobby on the stands, our invitation cards rather, are in the stands in the lobby out there. And we've asked that you take those and pass them out wherever you go, any place you do business. If you leave one, it has our social media information, our announcements, 
uh, pertinent information about the church. We want folks to know that we are here and want to minister to them. Those of you that are joining us by live stream now, we're in the second service of the morning at Maranatha Family Church, and you're with us in Rinkin, Georgia, just north of Savannah. And we invite you to come worship with us anytime that you are in our area. Our ushers are coming now to receive our Sunday morning tithe, missions, and offerings. God bless you as you give. We're at the end of the month. If you've not yet put your missions in, I've got my check written out to go in. We want to keep all of that current. Am I still understanding it's twelve about 12000 a month uh, for missions? And uh, I can say this because I'm not the pastor here, but we are blessed to be in one of the top missions-giving churches in the entire Assemblies of God in America, over 13,000 churches. This is one of the top giving churches in the entire country. And I can also say this because I'm not the pastor. It takes good leadership to do that. You appreciate this guy? Amen. 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 Father, bless our giving today. Thank you in advance for what's coming in today. And we pray that each succeeding month we will see even greater increases in our tithes, our offerings, and our missions. And we're going to thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning, Maranatha. Thank you so much for choosing to begin your day in worship here with us. Let's take a moment and see what's coming up on our church calendar. Ladies, if you're in the women's choir for the upcoming WM service, our final rehearsal is today at 5 o'clock, so don't miss it. We need all of our girls' ministry teachers and helpers to meet with Kelly in the fellowship hall immediately after second service today. Lunch will be provided. This Wednesday, all services and activities are canceled. Spend time with your families, and we'll be back to normal next week. This Saturday, our men's group, Momentum, will meet at 8 o'clock for our monthly breakfast. Please come out and invite a friend along. Men, if you would like to attend the Legacy Men's Conference from March 10th to 11th, please sign up in the foyer. Last year was a great time, and we're looking forward to better things this year. Venture Kids is beginning to collect candy for this year's Easter exploration. This is open to our kids and communities, so we need all the candy we can get. There is a donation box set up in the foyer. Please make sure the candy you donate will fit in an egg and won't melt. Thanks for your support. Venture Kids and Synergy are coming together for March Madness to raise money for missions. They will be doing a skate-a-thon on March the 22nd. We are sending home forms to help your kids and teens raise their pledges. We hope you will be a part of helping us raise money to spread the gospel. Thanks again for worshiping with us today. Oh, 
God, let His glory abide. So glad you're here today. Thank you for being here. I've had a, I told them in the earlier service, I've had kind of a tough week. I have driven over a thousand miles. I was just sitting there thinking the last hour and a half of it coming in Thursday, I don't quite remember. And uh, that's not a real good thing. <laughs> when you get back and you wonder, how'd I get here? <laughs> We're, uh, I was at a meeting where a group of preachers got together. I don't remember how many of us, maybe 30 of us, raised over $300,000 for missions to Cuba. And uh, that's pretty exciting, except that I heard their superintendent, as he said to us, 
he said, we're just now beginning to make an increase. Just over 12 years ago, there was just 1% who were Christians. Now there's like 12%. Man, it's just growing in leaps and bounds. Churches are opening up. They tried to shut us down. COVID tried to shut us down. But God is doing a work in Cuba like you can. I, I really believe we're seeing one of the greatest revivals in Cuba that we've ever, ever seen. People are getting saved. It's, a, it's magnificent. And, uh, and you get to be a part of that because you're so kind and generous and you're giving to missions. We're able to do that. This, this church was able to give this year to, in total over $300,000. Um, not bad for a small church. And we're believing God to do even more as we go along. Those of you who are visiting with us as well as uh, our regular uh, folks, we have a new uh, window decal. Isn't that pretty? And uh, Julianne helped us to develop a, a new little portion of our logo. And it declares what we do around here, one faith, one family, one mission. And as you go out this morning, if you'll pick one up, put it on your uh, car window, uh, that'll help identify you as part of us. I told them earlier, uh, Teresa wouldn't let me put one on my truck. I, I, I kind of don't drive real nice. And uh, well, it's not that I don't drive real nice. It's all those, well, it's all those lovely people God puts in my way to sanctify me. Uh, that uh, she said, you, you might not want to put one on your truck. You might want to hold off on that. <laughs> but if you'd pick one up, you're welcome to it. It cost us, but we want you to have it for free and just put it on your window and let people know that you're a part of the Maranatha family. That's what we are, great big old family. And we're glad that you're a part of it. You're, if you happen to be visiting with us today, if you're a guest, I just want to tell you how glad we are you're here. We can't think of a better uh, thing to do than have you. You've paid us a high compliment to come and to visit us today, and we don't take that lightly. So I hope you're treated in such a way that when you leave here today, you, you'll know that you've been treated well, and I'm glad that you're here today. We uh, want to take a moment to uh, introduce to you the Director of Church mobilization in Springfield, Missouri for the Assemblies of God, Dr. Dr. Billy Thomas and his wife, Valerie. They have been with us in the first service, and I just can tell you, you're in for a great sermon as well as uh, great singing. And we're here to, uh, to welcome them. They are here in town, and we ask them to come by and, and preach for us. We, we like to have uh, good preachers in, and Billy's a good preacher. And uh, I like him and his wife, Valerie. Their son is over our college ministry, Chi Alpha Ministry, in, uh, in uh, the University of Georgia. Go dogs! <laughs> and you know the people that won the national championship two years in a row? Uh, I just kind of explain that to you. Uh, he's, uh, he's over that, and he just married a young lady a few months, uh, like maybe a year ago. Wow. And, uh, man, he did good, too. He did well. <laughs> We're glad to have them today. Would you give them a warm Maranatha welcome as they come this morning? Did I do it right? Okay. Amen. It's such an honor and a privilege for us to be with you all today. And uh, we're one of the missionaries that you guys support. So we do want to say thank you for that. Um, you never know what your missions dollars are going to. I want you to know it's, it's reaching. It's reaching the world right now. It's reaching America um, for the things that we do. And we just want to say thank you for that. Thank you for the lives that have been changed because of your faithfulness to that. And what an honor it is for us to be here I wrote a song, this is many years ago I wrote this song, but it talks about 
that, that there's a miracle that's in your house. And some of you have prayed and you said, God, I need this miracle. I need this to happen. And God said, I'm going to do it, but it's going to be on my time. And you're just going to have to wait. And I don't know about y'all, but I have no patience. And so I, <laughs> I'm like, okay, God, I need this and I need this now. But when God gives you a promise, he is faithful. And he is going to fulfill that promise. And he is going to bring it to pass. You just have our part is the hardest part just to sit there and wait and be patient because there's a miracle that's in your house. And if he's promised, he's going to bring it through to you. Amen. She's not going to hear it again. You know, I was sitting there thinking as Val was singing, um, 
it was about 40 years ago, I was at an evangelist seminar and um, Jimmy Swagger was actually preaching that seminar. And I had gone with some other friends of mine and this 17-year-old girl walked up there to sing. And um, I went home that night and I called my mom. I said, I met the girl that I'm going to marry. And my mom said, really, what's her name? I said, I don't have any idea, but when you hear her sing, you'll know why I'm going to marry her. <laughs> and the next day I went and found her, literally had to hunt her down and um, found her and got her number. And four years later we got married. And I've been listening to her sing ever since. And uh, what was your name again? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the only thing I knew is she was from Georgia. And, um, it, oh, it gets worse. I was preaching in Houston, Texas, and we hadn't even dated. And I was really missing her. And I called her up and I said, hey, want to go to a wedding with me? She said, whose? I said, ours. She said, when? I said, first open date I've got in 30 days. She said, I'll be ready. Let's go. <laughs> and 30 days later, we got married. And left straight from Georgia, straight over to Texas to start our first revival. And um, have been going ever since. And so I think she's going to stay with me. Well, it is so good to see each and every one of you. And, you know, I, I know you, we come in and some of you remember us, some of you know us, some don't. And um, been married 37 years now. Our youngest son is the Chi Alpha Director at the University of Georgia. And we love people to remember that because they beat Alabama. Um, I felt an anointing over on this side. I felt an anointing coming right there. And uh, that's all that really mattered. I told somebody I'm from Kansas City originally, and I've been a Chiefs fan ever since I was a little boy. So this has been a great year for me. It has been a great year for me. But now the Royals are playing. My year just went downhill. And so, um, but it's, it's one of those times. But it is such a joy to be with you. It's a great church. You've got great leadership. We appreciate your pastor so much. And um, Brother Dave Reiner and Teresa have been just wonderful friends. They've done a great job everywhere they've been. It's just kind of one of those things. You watch a pastor and you know God has his hand upon him. And he's done such a wonderful job. And then when he asked Michael Branson to come in here and be with him, that one just shocked me. I said, you know, um, this is going to be too, oh, wow. I said, that church is in for a joy because these two have been friends for so long and they just do so well together. But I got to tell you, I got here, Mike Branson, I started preaching. I've preached for you in Vidalia, McDonough, and Texas. And then I come over here and saw you. And, you know, we text all the time and we talk every once in a while. I did not know he got married <laughs> and we are standing in the back door and he said yeah did I tell you I got married I said no and he starts pointing up there saying yeah that one right up there that's my wife and I'm thinking he's joking me <laughs> and then she tells me no I actually said I do <laughs> I, I've been in shock all morning um, I, I was just like that honorary guy um, but I, he is blessed you're blessed. They're both blessed, and so it's a joy to be here. You know, I do thank you, and I don't want to talk a lot about what I do and everything. I, I am the senior director of um, church mobilization, and really what that means is I get to work with all the local churches of the Assemblies of God, all, all churches, pastoral ministries, and everything. My job is to help those churches get built and grow. That's what my job is, and to help them succeed in things. Someone asked the other day, said, tell us exactly what you do. I said, someone told me the other day, and they said it this way, Billy's the great connector. He has the ability to connect pieces all over the country and make things happen. And it's just a blessing that God has blessed me with. I'm on a Delta flight at least twice a week. I live in a hotel. Um, we are so bad that we had a house in Springfield, Missouri, and I sold it because one month I realized I'd only slept in my own bed three nights. And when you've only slept in your own bed three nights and you're paying for a house, you decide forget it. So I moved my wife from a 2,500 square foot brand new home into a 588 square foot apartment that was built in 1917. And I want you to know she's been loving me ever since. Um, I told her, I said, that's all we need. It's really cheap and we give most of our money to missions then. And so that's what we're going to do. And so we moved in there and she looked at me and said, do you realize there's not a dishwasher and there's not a laundry? And I said, well, we're here and we both can wash dishes and we both can do laundry. And um, she said, both said, uh, it's your job. And so um, you move me in here, you're going to do it. But, you know, God has blessed us abundantly. In our travels, we have the privilege that we just help 
missionaries and help churches. That's what we do. Uh, last week I was back in Texas, and I think I mentioned this in my message when I was here last time, that we helped a church there to get a new sign down in the very bottom of Texas in one of the roughest parts, and we were down there for the dedication of that sign last Sunday, and we were able to get the money pulled together, and we paid for a new sign to be put up that lit up that entire area to let people know Jesus Christ can change their life. And it's in a very dark area, in a very rough area, a lot of gang activity, a lot of things happening there. In fact, when we got there, it was Val's first time to go down with me and she said you've got to be kidding me I said no it's a very rough area but you know what that little church we were there last Sunday and that little church that little lady pastor she said I just do my Bible study and they're running about 200 now in that service and God is blessing them it's all in Spanish I asked her I said how many here are illegal she goes over 80 percent of our church is illegal but they come across the line just because they want to hear about Jesus now think about that for just a minute and you know what? We put up the sign to say, hey, this is what's happening. Just got back from Puerto Rico, and last week we finished rebuilding the district offices. We were able to raise the money for that, and then we were able to put all the pieces together and get teams down there. How many of you know they've been having hurricanes and other things coming through there? They had been demolished. They took all the money that the district got and gave it to the local churches because they didn't have any money, and the district office was left with nothing. I walked in a few months back, and I looked at that office and was just devastated over what had happened. I mean, the, the ceilings literally were falling still into the floor. I had a team go out of Indiana and Ohio, and we praise God that they got those totally rebuilt. That's good news, isn't it? God bless it. You guys are a part of this. That's why I'm telling you, every dime that you give into this ministry, that's going to help us succeed at these things. Then we just had a young gal that's getting ready to leave in two weeks. She is going up to work with the Indian reservations and the Indians up in Montana. The children that are coming out of homes that are alcohol and drug infested, and they literally can't do anything, and she's going as an MA, so there was no money to help her buy a car, because unless you're a fully appointed missionary, you get no help with getting a car. And she needed to get up there to do this, and then she said, I need an all-wheel drive car. She's a little scared of the snow in Montana. And I said, yeah. She says, are you going to visit? I said, no. <laughs> but you know what we did? We were able to, and God blessed us, that we were able to raise all the money and just bought her a brand, uh, well, it's not brand new, but bought her a used car so that she's able to go to Montana and minister to those children. You were a part of that. I want you to know we appreciate you, and we appreciate what you do, because when we work together, we're able to see a lot of great things done. Amen? God's good. Take your Bibles. We've got to be out by three, so I want to go ahead and get started on this. I don't have any place to be till late this afternoon. I'm good. I have to be careful saying that. I said it one time and someone ordered a pizza. <laughs> the book of Matthew chapter 8, go with me to verse 23 and through 27. And I'm reading out of the New Living Translation this morning. Um, I kind of got hooked on this with our, our general superintendent. He read out of this with the thing I was with him on um, a few months back. And ever since then, I've kind of been just kind of going after some things here. Going with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 8, verse 23, and it reads as follows. Then Jesus got into the boat and started across the lake with his disciples. And suddenly a fierce storm struck the lake with waves breaking into the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, shouting, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. And Jesus responded, why are you afraid? You have so little faith. Then he got up and rebuked the wind and the waves, and suddenly there was a great calm. The disciples were amazed. Who is this man, they asked. Even the winds and the waves obey him. This morning I'd like to minister on the topic of two questions. Father, bless us. Touch our hearts today, Father. We're not here to hear anything of a man's wisdom or a man's knowledge. We want your spirit to transform our lives. Father, let none of us come in and just say, yeah, we went to church, but let us leave this place saying we've been changed by the power of a living God. Father, touch our lives. You have blessed us with wonderful worship today. You've blessed us with a wonderful time together in fellowship. Let your word come alive now in our hearts. And we give you the praise and the glory and the honor. And all God's people said, amen and amen. In October of 2018, I was preaching up in Boston, Massachusetts. I was actually speaking in one of our Bible colleges up there, and I'd received a call from the district superintendent of West Florida. 
As I got on the phone with him, in fact, we were out from there and we were walking around up at a mall, just walking, waiting till later that night for that service. And I was trying to get some steps in and he called and I'll never forget, he got on the phone and he said, Billy, we need you to come to West Florida as quick as possible. As I begin to list the story, we know the hurricane Michael had just hit a category five hurricane had come through with such destruction and dom demolition that, that it amazed people of what it could actually do. As they begin to tell me the stories of what was going on, houses were gone, churches were gone, everything was gone, trees were uprooted and thrown for miles, and things had happened that no one thought in their mind could actually take place. Most of us know that hurricane coming through saw a grand total of 74 deaths. But more than that, that hurricane had $25.1 billion worth of damage that was done there in Florida. I will never forget as he asked me to come down, he said, would you just fly down here? We still had time in Boston and I left my wife there to take care of Boston. She ran me to the airport. I jumped a plane, flew down there as quick as I could. I flew into Atlanta because I couldn't get a flight on into Florida because of the destruction at the airport and a friend picked me up and we headed straight down to Florida. We got down there and as I bent with the superintendent and began to walk around there and look, he got me into his vehicle and we began to go through the area looking at what had taken place. I've got to be honest with you, I'm 60 years old, just hit 60 a few days ago and I've never seen anything like what I experienced that day. I drove around there looking as houses were gone. There were concrete pads there. And then they began to point out things and they pointed at this one concrete pad and they said that was one of our churches. My heart broke. We drove around a little while later. We found one of the steeples that had been on one of our churches about three miles away from where it was supposed to be. It had been picked up and just dropped over here. We watched as things were going on and people were just standing in the streets not knowing where to go or what to do. And I finally looked at him and I said, why am I here? What's my job here? And he said, well, two things. We need help rebuilding these churches. And we know that your group is the one that does this. And I want to give this testimony. Just about a month ago, we dedicated the last of the churches and we've rebuilt every one of them that was destroyed. That's good news right there. But I will never forget as I sat there, he said, I want you to speak to the pastors. We're going to do two groups, one in the morning and one in the evening. And I want you to tell them they're not alone. It's going to be okay. I spoke at the first group and we had a, a brunch with them and we ate together. And then I spoke and shared my heart with them. And I told them, we're going to be here to help you. We're going to stand with you. You're not going to go through this alone. I then got to the evening service and I did the best I could. I thought to myself, I, I seemed like my words were, were just not holding any weight with what they had gone through. What I was having to do was try to tell people you're going to make it when they had lost everything. Until one man walked up to me and he asked a question that I just stood there. In my position, I'm supposed to have answers. I'm supposed to know the answers. And I didn't know the answer to this one real quick. He looked at me without blinking an eye and he said, I got a question for you, preacher. I said, what's that question? He said, where was Jesus when this took place? Yeah, we're quick to give our answers. Oh, he was with you. He was there. But the feeling he was having right there, that feeling that he was going through, what he was going through within his own self, he was feeling like, where was Jesus in the midst of this? My heart broke as I began to look him in the eye and I finally said, I know that Jesus knew what was going to happen because Jesus knows what has happened in my life. He knows what's happening now and he knows my future. But I said, I, I don't know how to explain to you that I know he was with you in the midst of it all. He turned and walked away and that has been a haunting time of my life ever since because I've had to live with the haunt that goes within me of looking at myself in the mirror and knowing how am I supposed to explain the fact that Jesus was there in the midst of the storm. We all live through storms. We all go through storms. Storms seem to overtake us every time we turn around. It seems like we live in the midst of a storm-ridden society. We have some financial storms. We have physical storms. We have family storms. We have storms that go on all the time. My wife started reading the list of all the companies that are getting ready to close stores the other day. And she said, can you believe all these places are closing? My nephew just got laid off because Bed Bath & Beyond had closed there. And all of a sudden we hear Best Buy's closing, Tuesday morning's closing. They're closing stores all around. And I looked at her and I said, people are going to lose jobs. She looked at me and she said, but what's going on? I said, they're living through storms. 
We live through storms every day, and yet those storms come back to us, and we begin to ask that same question. We go to church. We live in the body of Christ. We're trying to do the best we can, and why are we in the storm? And too often times we feel like we're not going to be able to make it through. We don't know how we're going to make it. How are we going to get through this? How are we going to get through the situations when the doctor calls you in and says this is it? I had one of my missionaries contact me just two days ago. And he said, I don't even want to tell you what they said. But he said, you've got to pray. My wife and I are at the doctor now. And what they just told us, it's just not good. It was a storm. People were laid off. It was a storm. Your kids are in trouble. It's a storm. And you ask yourself, why am I going through this storm? As I begin to look through this, all of a sudden, this has been pounding on me since 2018. It is literally set in my mind as I begin to think about this. And I ask the same question of my own self. Why is Jesus in the midst of these storms? And all of a sudden, the Lord took me back to the scripture I read as my text. And he said, these are five things that I want you to learn. And so today, I'm not really preaching a sermon as much as I'm telling you. This is what Jesus began to teach me. And I think the first thing was so real. And it came out to me so real. Storms happen even when we're walking in his will. There comes a place in every one of our lives that when storms begin to happen, the naysayers around us, the people that are talking to us, they always say, what'd you do to have to go through this? What'd you do wrong? I love it when people come up and say, oh, you're going through a storm. What sin did you commit? What about this? It might be just biblical if we'll take it biblically that sometimes storms happen even when we're walking in the will of God. You know, if you go back in the scripture and you look at chapter 8 clearly, it tells us that the disciples were with Jesus. And what did Jesus do? He said, I want you to get into the boat. I want you to row to the other side. And they got in the boat and were rowing to the other side. They were walking in the perfect will of God. And there comes times that we begin to walk in the perfect will of God. And when we're walking in that perfect will of God, we think that because there's obedience and walking in his will, everything in life's going to be perfect. I come to bring you the good news that when we're walking in the perfect will of God, it doesn't mean everything's going to be perfect, but it means you will never have to walk it alone. It means he's going to be beside you no matter what. He's going to walk with you no matter what, and Jesus is going to take you through. I believe the disciples were there that day and as they began to get into that boat, they were thinking he told us to go, the sun's going to shine, the motor's going to run and we're going to have a great sail time across the waters. But all of a sudden the winds and the waves begin to come up and they found themselves in the midst of a storm. We often think that obedience is going to be discovered just in abundance. But what we don't understand is that obedience is not discovered in abundance. Obedience is discovered in peace. Because when we're obedient to God, it's not just the things we're going to get. It's the peace we have in the midst of the storms. Because obedience brings peace. And when we're obedient to God, he will bring us a perfect peace. The disciples are all the time telling him, we will go with you. We will do. The word tells us in Matthew 8, 18 through 22 about a young teacher that came to him and said, I want to follow you. And Jesus said, okay, follow me, but leave all the things behind. You don't need to go deal with those things. And he said, I can't do that and follow you. And Jesus said, fine. Let me tell you something. I would rather leave everything behind and follow Jesus. I would rather leave everything behind and follow Jesus. I would rather leave everything behind and follow Jesus than go back and and face what the world has to give. The world has to give death and destruction. My God gives hope and faith. And my God will take me through no matter what. And there is hope when we're in him. I think the second thing that we have to learn about storms is our vision is easily altered by the storm. Too often times we get into the midst of the storm and we quit looking at Jesus and we look to the storm. We all know the story of Peter. We know it all so well. Peter was in the boat one day and it was out there and things were getting really rough and Jesus came walking on the water. No one likes to make a big deal about Jesus walking on the water. It was just the fact that Peter wanted to get out of the boat. And all of a sudden, Peter looked up and said, hey, if that's really you, bid me to come to you. It was his idea. It's what he wanted to do. And Jesus said, come on then. If that's what you want to do, come on out here. And the word tells us he bent over the boat and he was it out there. And as long as his eyes were on Jesus, he was fine. The moment he began to look at the storm around him and began to see the storm blowing around him, the word said he began to sink. And he began to call out to Jesus saying, I'm sinking. 
I got news for you. Jesus saved him. He grabbed him and lifted him up. But it wasn't the grab that lifted. He needed to learn to set his eyes upon Jesus. When our vision is set up on Christ, it doesn't matter what blows. It doesn't matter what comes our way. It doesn't matter what the doctor says. We're going to do what God has called us to do. He was out there on that boat and it was Jesus, everything, Jesus was down there and he was really quiet. And I think one of the things that was a problem was they couldn't see Jesus. The Bible tells us that he was asleep down in the bow of the boat and he was asleep down there. Now, if the disciples would have been smart and they would have really thought about it, then when the storm came up, they would have just gone down and gone to bed with him. Let's just go down there and lay down and go to sleep too because if he's asleep, we're gonna stick with him. But instead, they stayed up there away from him and forgot what it was, get ready for this, what it was to be in his presence. We want to see Jesus all the time. We want to see him move. Someone asked me one time, said, have you ever been to church and seen a real move of God? I said, yeah, every time I'm in the house. Oh, he got quiet there. Now, come on. Every time I'm in the house, I see a real move of God. And they said, no, no, we're talking about a real move of the Spirit of God. I said, yeah, every time I'm in the house. And they said, what do you mean every time you're in the house? I said, I go expecting God to move. I said, I go planning for God to move. And you know what? It doesn't have to be someone shouting. No one has to walk on the back of the pews. No one has to jump up and down for me. But I know that my God's there. And if my God is there, his presence makes everything real in my life. The presence makes everything real. And all of a sudden, the word says that he, they were there looking around and they were trying to find Jesus. And they were getting their eyes off of him because they didn't understand what presence was. I don't want to preach all about presence, but I got to go here with this. There comes a time in our life that we've got to close our eyes and know that everything's okay. Val and I stay in hotels all the time. We are, we're in a different hotel all the time. It's just one of those things of life. It's what we do. And she's learned to carry nightlights with her because one of us is afraid of the dark. And one of us believes that if you're going to sleep, it needs to be pitch dark. And, and I always tell her this. I, I'm the one that needs to get up and find the restroom. And I told her, if you want me to find the restroom, you got to give me a light somewhere. And so she's all the time putting out nightlights. She has a little nightlight she puts out in our rooms. But you know, the other night we were there and we, she had forgotten the nightlights. And she said, Billy, I forgot the nightlights. And I said, it'll be okay. And I'll never forget what she did. We laid down in bed and it was dark in that room when she turned out the lights. And she said, close your eyes really, really tight. And if you close your eyes really, really tight, when you open them, you'll see me here. So I closed my eyes really, really tight. And she got right there. <laughs> and when I opened my eyes, I screamed like I had never screamed before. <laughs> I thought the devil had come in for sure. She's got her eyes bugged out and she's grinning at me laughing. She thought that was the funniest thing she'd ever done. And you think it's funny too, don't you? I used to like you. And, and, and I'm sitting there looking at her and I go, what are you doing? She goes, if you'll close your eyes tight, you'll wake up and know that I'm here. Some of you, your storm has been taking your sight so much that you forgot his presence. Close your eyes. Stop looking at the things going on around you. Stop looking at those things that are there and realize that Jesus is there. Isaiah 26 said, you keep him in perfect peace. His mind has stayed on you. Isaiah 41 said, fear not for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Joshua 1, 9 said, have I commanded you be strong and courageous? Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you. Sometimes we have to hang on to God. I was taking a flight a few months back. It was one of the few flights I was on that Val wasn't with me. She's usually with me everywhere I go. But this one she had to stay. She was helping her parents in, here in Georgia and I had to fly by myself. And a lot of our flights were on little bitty planes because I fly between here and Springfield a lot. I got on that little plane and then the lady sitting next to me, there's a little two-seater on each side and the lady was going to sit next to me, is a little older lady and she gets on and points that that's her seat and I get up and let her in because trust me, you don't crawl over someone on those small planes, especially my size. If you do, you'll be in my lap. And um, 
she got on the plane and I noticed she was a little bit nervous and I and she started trying to talk to me and I like to read a lot on the plane I read a lot and I was wanting to read and she just wanted to talk and she finally said I got a question I said what's that she goes do you think this flight's going to make it well, if I'm living on your faith, no, no. Um, I said, well, yeah, yeah, I believe this flight's going to make it. I said, are you okay? She says, no, it's my first flight and I'm really scared. I said, well, it's going to be okay. And she said, well, well, how do you know it's going to be okay? And, and I'm trying to calm her. And finally, I, I got a little frustrated with her. And I turned and I said, ma'am, let me be real blunt with you. I'm a preacher of the gospel. I said, I've been praying and God gave me a sermon for a church. I'm on this plane because i got to get to that church and preach that sermon. If this plane was not going to make it, God would not have given me the sermon and I would not be on this plane to go she sat there for a long time she said so you know you're going to make it I said yeah she reaches over and grabs my arm just as tight as she can I said what are you doing she said buddy if this plane goes down and you're walking away I'm walking away with you she said I'm going to hang on to you and no matter what happens to everyone else you and I are going to make it she held on to me so much that I had marks on my arm when I got off that plane and when we got off I walked away from her as fast as I could because I was afraid she's going to get in the car and go with me again but I'll sit there and I learn something. There comes a time that if you think everybody else is going down and everything else is going to fall around you, you've got to learn what it is to grab hold of God and say, God, I might not be able to see you. I might not even know where you're at right now, but I know your presence is real. And no matter what happens to me, I'm hanging on to you because this storm is not going to take me down. This storm is not going to take me down. This storm is not going to take me down. Number three, was I supposed to be done by 12? I look at his wife. What time you usually get out? <laughs> he ain't taking you home today. Let me finish this up. Number three, fear tries to live in the storm. Jesus asked the question, why are you afraid? Too many times when we are trying to walk in faith, we allow fear to overtake us and we allow fear to get breath. Breath is what gives life. And when we give life to our fears, we're dismissing our faith. Catch that line, it's really good. And when we begin to allow fear to breathe, we're giving it life. And the more life that we give to our fear, the more it comes up in us. And the more it comes up in us, it pushes out the faith that we have to believe in God. And all of a sudden, we realize something here. That when fear begins to overtake us, we begin to allow fear to overtake us. And our faith is gone and we quit believing that God can do, get ready for this, the supernatural. The supernatural is what God wants to do. And I want to tell the story because I told it the first time and I'm going to tell it again and I'm going to do it fast. But I'll never forget one of my first things that I did when I was in the ministry. I was very young. It was 40 years ago before Val and I were ever married. I was asked to go to West Africa to help write youth programs. I got to West Africa and they took me into Sierra Leone and I went into Sefadu and Kinema was the two main places that I worked. They got me to Kinema, and I'll never forget the missionaries I was there with. They looked at me, and they said, listen, we got a problem. I said, what's wrong? And they said, we have cancer, or he had cancer, and we've got to go back to the States. I said, when do we leave? And they said, you don't. I had, not, I had not ever been anywhere. I grew up in Kansas City. I went to CBC to Bible College, and, and I had never been farther than, out of the, I hadn't been within three hours from my mama at this point. And now here I am in Africa, and they're telling me I'm going to be by myself in the center of cannibalism. I had a slogan, white meat is tough. <laughs> hey, it worked. Every few months they would sacrifice people. And we'd hear about it. Things that they did over there I don't even like to talk about because it was unbelievable. This is 40 years ago. There are no phones. There was no cell phones. There's nothing that we could communicate with people on. No way to communicate in any way. And I, I, I had a radio, a ham radio back there that the missions only got on it on Saturday mornings. And so I, I didn't have a lot of hope of anything. Tom and David worked in the house there with me. And they were going to try to get gas to get me out of there because... All of a sudden, one of the people came down to the town and told Tomba, said, listen, we need to tell you, they've picked the people they're going to sacrifice tonight, and Billy Thomas is one of them. 
your, your head of the house is going to be one of them. And I guess they had looked at me and thought they could feed the whole village with me. And so we're going to go for it. Not a word. <laughs> He'd come up to me after service when I told that. The first service came up after service and said, Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> and you said, I do. <laughs> But I will never forget Tom and David wanted to hide me. They wanted to get me out of there. And I said, there's nothing we can do. We can't hide. And they said, what are you going to do? I said, we're going to pray. I said, we're going to pray and believe God because there comes a time that you can't allow fear to overtake your faith. And you have to begin to say, listen, I'm not going to allow fear to take me down. Fear is not going to be what gets me. And all of a sudden, we begin to pray. Late that night, we heard him coming. You could hear the roar of that little community, the roar of the people. And we saw him coming down our street. And Tom and David are freaking out. And they're, they're going crazy. And I'm watching. I'm in the second floor up at the top. I figure if I'm going to get as far away as I can. And I'm looking out there at them. And all of a sudden, they got right to our driveway, out to the drive. And I could still see it. I could still, I could still see it. And they got right to that edge. And all of a sudden, just they got to the edge, we heard screaming and yelling of people. And they were beginning to drop the torch things that they had in the because we had no electricity. There were no lamps at that time. And they start dropping things on the ground and running away screaming as fast as they could. And Tom and David said, what happened? I said, I don't know what happened. But all I know is they're leaving and they're running away screaming. And Then we only slept a couple hours that night and Tomba went into town the next day to find out what had happened. And they began to ask the question of Tomba, who were the two giant men that were standing at the edge of your driveway with the great big swords high up in the air that when we got down there, they began to scream at us and yell and said they scared every one of us and we knew we could not go on that property and take them down. Tomba come back to me and said, Brother Billy, who were the two giant men? We didn't see them from our side. They saw them from their side. And I said, I don't know. A few days later, we were able to go to Freetown. And I was able to call my mother. And it's, you have to pay and then wait and wait and wait and wait. And finally, they tell you there's a phone in the little booth. And you can go in and you're yelling and barely hearing. And mom's screaming. She said, Billy, I got to know. I got to know what happened three nights ago. I said, why? She said, because back in Kansas City, your grandma was woke up. And she called me in the middle of the night and said, we got to pray right now. Billy's in trouble. And we need angels dispersed to him right now. She said, we prayed until grandma said God did it the angels were dispersed I got news for you when fear begins to overtake you you've got to get your eyes off the fear and tell it you're not going to live in this why because God will send his angels to protect you he will send everything he needs to take care of you he will take you through no matter what it is that's going on God is going to take you through number four Jesus talks to storms All of a sudden, if you look at the scripture, when they went and got him, he came up. And we always think that when we want God to speak to us, we want him to tell us how great we are and how he's going to bless us, how he's going to do us. I don't need God to speak to me. Boy, it got quiet on that line. I don't need God to speak to me. He speaks to me through his word every morning when I get up and start reading it. I got a Bible. The B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. Come on, does anybody remember those old songs? And all of a sudden, I found out something. I don't need God to speak to me. He already spoke to me. You know what I read in my Bible today? Today I read, he's going to protect me. He's going to take care of me. He's going to bless me. He's going to hold me fast. He knows the hairs on my head. He knows everything he's, I have need of. He knew me before. He knows me today. He's got my plans for tomorrow. He already knows everything that's going on. He's already told me all of that. You know what I need my God to do? I need my God to speak to my storms. I need him to walk out in the midst of my storms and say, oh, no, you're not going to do this to Billy. Oh no, you're not going to do this. I need God to stand up to my storms and say, no, peace be still and my storm go calm. Some of you are wanting to hear God speak to you. Pick up your Bible and read it. But when we need God to speak, what we need God to start doing is speaking to our storms. You say, did he do that? Yeah, he spoke to the serpent, to the serpent with even Adam in the book of Genesis. He rebuked Cain in Genesis. He rebuked Moses for striking the rock. God rebuked constantly. Nathan and rebuke King David and all of a sudden if you look at all the rebuking it goes all the way down where it says in Matthew 25 he'll rebuke the goats on his second coming why because Jesus said I will tell all of them you're not going to do this when I'm around there comes a place that we have to realize that we need Jesus to speak to our storms and the fifth thing 
I think the reason we struggle with this is number five is simply this. There's only one who controls the storms. And his name is Jesus. I think the greatest thing that happened with these two questions was Jesus come out and ask them, why are you afraid? And they answered it with the second question. Who is this man? Now, I want, I want you to walk with me for just one second here. Why are you afraid? Who is this man? I mean, I love to read in the book of Matthew. Because in Matthew 8, we also have the story of the Jesus returning to Capernaum and the Roman officer that came to him. And he told him, he said, you know, my servant is sick. And he said, I want you to come and please. He said, his young servant would lie in the bed paralyzed in terrible pain. And Jesus said, I'm going to come and heal him. And all of a sudden, the man said, you don't have to come. If you'll just speak the words, I know who you are. And if you'll just speak the words, I know who you are. And he will be made whole. What do we see in this? We see that the Roman officer knew who he was. The disciples didn't. It's really frightening, isn't it? It's really frightening that we can go through life talking about Jesus and singing to Jesus and praising Jesus and asking the question, do we know Jesus because too often times we come to church and we live through it all but we really don't know him I've made it my goal of 2023 to know him I want to know him I don't want to know about him I want to know him and when you begin to know him you begin to know these things about who he was. I think the first thing I really wanted to know is what did he really do when he was here? Did you know Jesus performed 37 different miracles? He turned the water into wine because he, he wanted to show that he was there to help and his mother looked at him and, and he turned the water into wine and, 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 and he was providing these things. He showed there, I will give provision. He healed the official son of Capernaum like I just talked about. He drove out the evil spirit with the man of Capernaum. He, Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law when she had a fever. He healed many that were sick and oppressed that evening after the mother-in-law. Then the first miraculous catch of fish. When they couldn't catch any fish, he told them, throw your net on the other side. And, and they said, wait a minute, we're not that dumb. You know, If they're not on this side, they're not going to be on that side. The boat's not that big. He said, just watch this. And they threw their nets over there, and they brought in a great catch. Oh, even more than that, he fed the people of fire. 5,000 and he took 5,000 with just a few loaves of fish and then he did it again with 4,000 and the people were still saying what's really going on he raised the widow's son from the dead he calmed the storms on the sea he cast out demons and sent them into pigs he healed two blind men he healed a man who was unable to speak he healed an invalid in Bathsheba he fed the 5,000 he fed the 4,000 he heals a man born blind by spitting in his eyes what do I tell you today I say that when I found out who Jesus was he was one that said I don't care what your storm is I'll fix it he is a God that said I'll fix it whatever your storm is and whatever is going on in your life I'm the one that can help you I'm the one that can take care of it I'm the one that can make it whole and yet at times we wonder where is he where is he where is he? He's never left. When you ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart and come into your life, he comes to live in you and he never leaves you. You say, but there are things I've done that weren't right. Yeah, he knows. You don't have to tell me. Talk to him about that. I can't forgive you. He can. He never leaves you nor forsakes you. He sticks closer to you than a brother. He holds your hand in the midst of the storm. I always like to put it this way. He holds my umbrella while the rain's pouring down. He holds it fast to be there in the midst of it all. When I don't know what to do, I just don't know what to do. 
I'm going to close it with this, and I, I haven't told anybody this. So it's just, yeah, might as well talk. A few weeks ago, Val was here in Georgia taking care of her parents, and I had just flown in from a long trip, and things weren't good. I wasn't physically well. I was having a lot of physical issues. And um, I was having some problem with my leg, and I knew I had a blood clot, and I knew things weren't good. And um, I was at the apartment in Springfield by myself, and um, I needed to get to the hospital, and I don't spend any money. I, my wife says that I'm the cheapest person she's ever met. And um, last night she wanted to eat dinner, and I said, well, okay, we'll go eat. Where do I have a coupon to? And I sure enough went through and found my coupon so I could take her to dinner last night. And, and I told her, if you don't like it, <laughs> find another coupon. That's my life. Well, I didn't want to bother anybody else to take me to the hospital. And yes, I've been chewed out for this quite a lot. But I got in the truck and drove myself to the emergency room. And I got to the emergency room and I had called my doctor. And he said, Billy, I want you to go in and get a sonogram done. I need to know what's going on right now. So I got there and they did the sonogram. And then this doctor walks in and says, um, we're putting you in the hospital. We're going to put you on all this stuff. And we're doing all these things. This was just two weeks ago. And we're doing all these things to you, and we're going to put an IV in, and that had to do with a needle, and so that was not of God. And um, I said, look, I just wanted the sonogram. Could you send that to my doctor? And she said, yeah, but we're going to keep you overnight. And I said, no, you're not. She said, yes, we are. And I said, no, you're not. And the nurse is looking at me, and she's behind the doctor, and I can see the nurse getting tickled because I'm not upset. I'm not mad. I'm just telling her, no, you're not. And she said, yeah, you need to stay in the hospital tonight, and we're going to run 17 different tests on you. I said, which are? She said, well, the first thing is we're going to roll you into that tube and let that thing go around you. I said, no, you're not. <laughs> I get in a tube of an airplane every once in a while because there's a chair I can sit in. I ain't rolling into no tube with my wife not here. And she said, well, your wife can't do anything about it. And she don't realize the last time they wanted to do that test on me, they tried to roll me into that tube and I got really panicky and I wasn't doing well. And so they brought my wife in and put that iron thing over her and she stood there with my hands hanging out, holding my hands, singing Amazing Grace. Um, some of you think we're joking. We're not. And literally when I got done and they pulled me out of that tube thing, they had got all the doctors and nurses standing outside the window watching the couple singing Amazing Grace to do a test. Um, we harmonized real well. But the doctor finally walked in and she said, Are you not afraid of dying? I'm the wrong person to say that to. I said, nope. She said, what if you die tonight? <laughs> Sounded pretty good to me. <laughs> and she said, wait a minute, what? And I looked at her and I said, for me to die is gain. And she said, oh, you're one of them. <laughs> and I said, ma'am, it's not that I'm one of them. It's that I'm okay. You did what I asked you to do. Please send it to my doctor. But you're not going to do this and keep me here with my wife not here. I need her here with me. I tell that because I want you to hear this. I needed her here with me because her presence gave me a peace. And if I'm going to go through something and I'm going to choose to go through it, I choose to pick those that are going to go through with me. Some of you have been going through some things and you feel like you're all alone. You feel like you're facing it by yourself. You're not alone. It's okay to take someone with you because Jesus will be there with you. And sometimes it's good to say, you ain't sticking me in that tube without my wife here. If you have to listen to me sing alone, it's not real good. 
But some of you need to know. I don't know why this is hitting me so hard right now. I'm, I'm, I'm done. So you're feeling like you're alone. This old preacher came down here to tell you, I don't care how bad the storm looks right now, you're not alone. You're not alone. It's going to be okay. I do altar calls a little different because I, I know we all bow our head and close our eyes and we, 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 we start asking questions until we get a response. I'm not going to do that today. I don't want you bowing your head and closing your eyes. This is blunt and to the point. If you're here today and you'll say, Billy, I'm going through a storm. And I've been wondering if I'm going to make it. I don't want to know what your storm is. I don't care if it's finances or home or sickness. I don't care what it is and it doesn't matter to anybody else what it is. But you'll say, I've been walking through this storm and I just... No, I'm going to make it. Don't raise your hand. Just stand up right where you're at right now. If that's you, just stand up. I'm going to pray for you. And God's getting ready to do something in this room. You say, Billy, I've been going through it. It's just, I, there's more I know in this room. And I'm going to wait just a few seconds longer. I will not wait a long time. I'm not going to wait a long time. It's not my nature to wait. It's okay. I know sometimes it hurts. Sometimes it hurts. Now, guys, this is what I do. This is just me. You got some people standing right now, and I see some of you grabbing each other. I need at least two people around every person standing in this room right now. As fast as you can. If you're not standing, stand now. Go to them. Move to them. Two people around each of them. There's a lot of things that are getting turned loose right now in this room. That It's happening all across this room. We're going to see it happen as God's getting ready to do it. Just watch this. Watch what he's getting ready to do. He's getting ready to do it. I need at least two or three people with everyone. With everyone in this room. Don't, don't wait on someone else. It's not someone else's job. Now some of the people that you're standing with, some of the people that you're holding on to, have got a lot of pain that they're turning loose of right now. There is a lot that is happening right now. I want you to begin to just pray for them and love them and get ready. We're going to pray right now. We're going to see what God's going to do. Let it go. Father, in the name of Jesus, by the anointing of your Holy Spirit, Lord, I pray for a move of your spirit right now in every person that stood across this room. Father, there is pain right now that they have been going through storms, and some of them have felt so alone that they have not known where to turn or what to do. And Father, right now, by the anointing of your Holy Spirit, I pray by the power of a living God, move, move within them right now. I pray, Father, that you will pour out upon every one of them right now. Let your Holy Spirit descend into them and let them feel your peace that passes all understanding and let them know, Lord, you are taking them through this storm. Father, speak to our storms right now. Speak to the storms. Speak to the storms right now. And, Lord, tell the storms it's time to cease. Father, let your miraculous power begin to move in every one of them and let them say, God, I see that you you have done what you said you would do. Father, calm the storms. I pray right now blessings of finances. I pray jobs. I pray health. I pray family situations. I pray that your spirit will begin to move and lives will be changed by the transformation of what you're doing. Father, we give it to you. We lay it down. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, I want you to hug the person you're...